Hello and welcome back to my channel. If you are a subscriber to my channel, welcome back and thank you for your interest and support. If you're not a subscriber, but you'd like to see more, please like, subscribe, and click on the notification bell so you don't miss any new interesting videos. All right, so let's get into it. This video is titled Black First Ladies of the United States. I'm gonna show you that these brown women were considered extremely beautiful and they were highly sought after. I'm also going to show you that this belief changed towards the latter part of the 19th century as white supremacy crept its way into the fabric of both American and European societies. I'm going to start off covering the subject of complexion. For those of you that have seen my videos, this will not be new to you. However, I'm going to cover it briefly for those of you that have not seen my videos. I also highly suggest if you haven't seen my previous videos, go back and check them out. Watching them will give you a better understanding of what I'm trying to educate people on regarding the history of people of color. Okay, so let's quickly go over a few words. The first word is complexion. Complexion is, according to the Noah Webster's 1828 dictionary, the color of skin, particularly of the face, the color of the external parts of the body or thing, as a fair complexion or dark complexion, the complexion of the sky. Also, if you search for the word complexion on google.com, it states, complexion is the natural color, texture, and appearance of a person's skin, especially of the face. All right, so the second word is brunette. The word can be spelled either way, and I'll show those on the screen. However, it means the same thing. According to Noah Webster's 1828 dictionary, the word means a woman with brown or dark complexion. According to the Chamberlain's English Dictionary of 1872, the word brunette means a woman with a brown or dark complexion. Of course, I can hear the skeptics saying already, well, complexion means only hair and eye color. According to the same dictionary, the word complexion means the state of being complex, texture, physical character or disposition of the body, hue of the skin, especially of the face. Okay, so I consulted one more dictionary. It's called A Dictionary of the English Language, 1863. And according to this dictionary, brunette means a woman with a brown or dark complexion. Again, for the skeptics out there, the same dictionary states the word complexion means color of the skin, temper temperament of the body. Okay, so hopefully these definitions are sufficient enough for even the folks that can't seem to wrap their heads around the meaning of these words because they are so indoctrinated with white supremacist lies and miseducation that even when presented with evidence, they continue to deny the truth. Something that I alluded to earlier in the video was the term brunette, which appears to have changed its meaning during the early to mid 20th century to mean only dark hair. This change ironically happens with the onset of white supremacy, which also occurred during the early 20th century. So present day, when referring to a brunette, it could mean anyone with dark hair. However, if that was the case before the 20th century, all women with brown or darker hair would have been described as brunettes. Of course, this wasn't the case at all. The truth is, only women with brown skin were referred to as brunettes. Also, during the same time, ironically, the word complexion was interpreted to mean only hair and eye color, even though most, if not all, dictionaries showed the word to mean the color of someone's skin, especially the face. It's my opinion that these words unofficially took on new meanings because the white supremacists understood the truth. They saw in books, newspapers, and paintings, etc., how many historically important people had brunette, swarthy, dark, brown, sable, dusky, and olive skin tones. So as to diminish the people with these traits, a propaganda crusade was commenced, and sorry to say, it worked well, and it's still working today. Also, as I mentioned before in my videos, it only takes telling a lie over time to create a new perception of reality. This same concept also changed many people's perception that people with brown skin are not as beautiful as people with lighter skin or lighter hair. I'm sure that's how the phrase, blondes have more fun, came about. Instead of saying, no matter your complexion, hair, or eye color, beauty is beauty, in my opinion, and I hope you agree, one does not have to dominate over the other. What is also ironic is that people with dark or darker skin and hair are still in the majority worldwide. However, we have been educated to believe that we are not as intelligent, industrious, or determined as our fellow lighter skinned human beings. Anyway, let me move on to what this video is ultimately about. Black, aka brunette, aka colored first ladies of the United States. 
Okay, so most of the evidence I will show you comes from historic newspaper articles. Just an FYI, I'm going to be jumping around a little bit with the time periods. All right, so this first article comes from the Times Philadelphia, and it's dated Monday morning, uh, February 9th, 1880. All right, so it's located under the first column, under the heading, First Ladies, Their Rules for the White House. All right, so we're going halfway down the page under the subheading, The Model of the White House, skipping down to where it reads, in a row, like schoolgirls in a class, stood the wives and daughters of the cabinet officials, with Mrs. President Hayes at the head. That it was strictly official was proved by the order observed in their positions. Just as the departments are ranked, the women stood. State, then Treasury, War, Post Office, Interior, and the Attorney General. Mrs. Hayes may safely be called a handsome woman, and there will none be found brave enough to dispute the palm. A brunette of the purest type, with large, brilliant eyes that conveyed the idea of surface but not depth, like a transparent window that opens into space. A rather low, Greek forehead over which is banded that shiny mass of satin hair. If the glossy coronet could be improved by wave or bangs, but the dark, rich brunette complexion forbids this modern fashion, and Mrs. Hayes is an artist in one or more ways. Clad in rich, ruby satin and silk combination, the corsage square and low as pompadour invented to call attention to her charms, no fault can be found with Mrs. Hayes, for her dress is as costly and showy as any worn by the celebrated beauties who flourished in the cabinet during the Grant reign. All right, so I'm not going to finish the article because I've read the part that I want you to hear. Okay, so hopefully you saw and heard what I read. The important part being a quote which reads, The dark, rich brunette complexion forbids this modern fashion. Okay, so there are two things here. The first one is President Rutherford B. Hayes' wife, Lucy Webb Hayes, is a woman of color. And secondly, she had a brunette complexion that was dark and rich. All right, so just as a side note, I don't like President Hayes much because according to wikipedia.com, his presidency represents a turning point in U.S. history as historians considered it the formal end of Reconstruction by placating Southern Democrats, Hayes ended all federal efforts to bring racial equality to the South. In other words, Hayes, who was a staunch abolitionist, allowed the Southerners that lost the war off the accountability hook, which emboldened them to ramp up their white supremacist activities and take retribution on people of color, no matter their social or political status. What is also ironic is that the Confederacy consisted of both men of color and men of no color, a.k.a. white men fighting to keep their Southern way of life, which included slavery. The twist occurs when the Southern white men and women decided after Reconstruction that they will exclude their fellow Southerners of darker complexions, who had the status of being white and who fought side by side with them, denying them any favor or privilege. All men and women of color were lumped together and reclassified as colored or Negro, regardless if they had European heritage, if they were Indian, AKA Aboriginal to the Americas, or if they are indigenous to the Caribbean. I will be tackling that subject more in depth in a future video. All right, so moving on to the next brunette woman, you may find this one very interesting. All right, so this second article comes from the Harvard Herald, dated February 17th, 1893, page six. This article is titled, The Washington Family. All right, so I'm gonna start reading where it states, Martha Dangers was a beautiful and a Virginia Bell when at 17 she married Daniel Park Custis. Of their four children, two preceded their father to the tomb, and when the widow Custis married George Washington in 1759, she had but a son and a daughter. History gives us a few exquisite glimpses of the home life of Washington for the next few years. He and his wife were very nearly of the same age. Both born in 1732, both were wealthy, refined, and of the highest standing among the Virginia contemporaries. Washington loved the two children of his own. There was nothing to mar their domestic life. But in 1773, Martha Park Custis died, and Washington was long affected with a strange restlessness. Indeed, his domestic life never again seemed so calm till after the Revolution. Martha was sometimes called the Dark Lady or Dark Beauty because of her brunette complexion but she was both beautiful and amiable. All right, so that's the part of the article that I wanted to read to you. Let's see if you caught these three facts. The first one being President George Washington had no biological children. I didn't realize that. 
The second one was that Martha Washington was sometimes called the dark lady or dark beauty because of her brunette complexion. Let that sit with you for a second. Presently, calling someone dark anything is considered a negative term. However, back in the 1700s, dark lady and dark beauty was a compliment. Why? Because most women were a shade of brown, especially the elite. All right, and then the third is that President George Washington's wife, the first lady, was a woman of color. I want you to know that I found 14 different newspapers from all over the country that carried this same exact story. Why then haven't I heard about this obvious trait she possessed? Has there been a more famous president than America's first president, George Washington? Did this fact just slip historians' minds? Wake up, folks. Look at this picture of Martha Washington, okay? Does she look like a dark lady, a dark beauty, a dark anything? All right, so something that I want you to realize and take away from this is that white supremacist revisionist history not only represents false information, it also excludes information to keep you ignorant. Okay, so this next article comes from the Times Philadelphia, dated October 17, 1887, page 2. And the title of this article reads, Mrs. Cleveland's Gowns, The Taste of the President's Wife in Reception Dresses. All right, so we're going to skip down to the fourth paragraph, which reads, About the end of the month, it is not improbable that Mrs. Cleveland will indulge in a shopping and dressmaking expedition to New York. She has several fine, new, and expensive toilettes in mind. Her dresses of last season were from her French trousseau, which were then in good style and new to the public eye. Among these, the chef de javeur was her white satin trained bridal costume, which gave her a peculiar, fresh, innocent, and queenly appearance. Her other becoming dress was a rich ruby velvet, which gave her brunette complexion a richer shade. A very elaborate black dress and train with beaded lace was perhaps the least becoming. An elegant gray gave the distinguished lady also a very beautiful appearance. All right, so two things stand out here. The first one is that Frances Cleveland had a brunette complexion that was made richer by wearing rich ruby velvet. And then the second thing that stands out is President Grover Cleveland's wife, the first lady, was a woman of color. All right, so just as another side note, Many of these articles that I will be presenting to you in this video were carried in multiple newspapers throughout the country at the time that they were published. You know, you should ask yourself, if he can find these articles this easy, why can't historians and PhDs do the same? And the answer is, they can and they have. They just don't want people to know the truth because Pandora's box would open and yeah, the truth might mentally set us free. All right, so let's take a look at the next article, which comes from the Boston Daily Globe, dated May 5th, 1876, page 3. All right, so located in the first column, all the way down at the bottom, the title of this article reads, Mrs. Secretary Taft's Popularity. All right, so this article goes on to read, Mrs. Taft has assumed the duties of her new position as the wife of a cabinet officer being at home to visitors on Wednesdays. A week ago, she held her first reception, assisted by the wife of General Marcy. The Secretary of War and his wife were then at the Arlington, but this week they have removed to the Ebbett House and Mrs. Taft received in her parlor at the hotel yesterday. She is a lady of dignified but courteous and even genial manner. There is a warmth in the grasp of her hand as she cordially welcomes a visitor, which the expression of genuine sincerity in her face would lead one to expect. She is tall and has a sufficient embodiment to become her height. Her clear, ruddy brunette complexion, dark hair, and beaming dark eyes at once impress strangers favorably, and her conversation and manner confirm the pleasant impressions. Okay, so first off, Mrs. Helen Heron Taft, at the time of this article, was the wife of Secretary of War William Howard Taft, who we all know went on to become U.S. President number 27 in 1909. Okay, again, two things stand out to me here. First of all, Mrs. Taft was a woman of color that possessed a ruddy brunette complexion. And secondly, she became first lady of President Taft, the 27th president of the United States. All right, so you may be saying to yourself, well, the article mentioned that she has a ruddy brunette complexion. So to clarify what color ruddy and brown looks like, I consulted Google, and here's what it looks like. To me, it looks like a reddish brown color. 
And just like the word ruddy is, means reddish, and of course brown is brown. So when you put the two together, it's like a coppery reddish brown. All right, so let's take a look at this next article, which comes from the Lamar's Sentinel, dated April 20th, 1882, page 8. All right, and this one is located in the fourth column, all the way down at the bottom. All right, so the title of this article is Notes of News. All right, so it goes on to read, Speaking of the White House, Ladd and Lassie, a Washington correspondent says, Nellie Arthur is a dark-eyed girl of 10 with a brunette complexion and very dark brown hair, worn short. The president's children do not resemble him except in the color of their eyes, they being dark brown without being black. Alan Arthur's eyes possess a dreamy softness that would be noticed if he were the son of a beggar instead of the only son of a president. Well, as you saw and heard, President Chester Arthur's daughter had dark eyes, brunette complexion, and very dark brown hair. Obviously, these are all three distinct categories. You'll also notice that the correspondent stated that the children did not resemble their father except in eye color. This leads me to believe that his son, Alan, also had a brown complexion. And this also implies that the first lady, Nell Arthur, probably had a brunette complexion because if you didn't get the complexion from dad, obviously you got it from mom. All right, so moving right along to our next article, and this one comes from the Boston Daily Globe, dated January 22nd, 1881, page 6. All right, so this article is located in the fourth column under the main title, Ladies Land League, then down to the subtitle, An Elderly Lady. All right, so it goes on to read, clad in a plain but neatly fitting suit of black silk. In appearance, she was about 40 years of age although in reality many years beyond that number had passed over her head. Her tread as she entered the room was as light and elastic as that of many of maiden of seventeen summers, and but for her snow-white locks and for the few soft lines, visibly upon her fair brow one might well call her a young woman. Her companion was much younger and of a far different appearance. Her dusky hair and brunette complexion contrasted sharply with the fair face and white locks of the elderly lady, who is none other than the mother of the man who, within a brief period of time, has aroused the world and made England tremble. She is the mother of Charles Stuart Parnell, and her companion was Miss Ellen Ford of New York, sister of the editor and publisher of The Irish World. To a casual observer, these two ladies possess nothing in common but their interest and their labor. All right, so I'd like to bring your attention to several items here. First, the article states that the young woman had a far different appearance than the older woman. And also, the younger woman had dusky hair and a brunette complexion, contrasting sharply with the fair face and white locks of the elderly lady. Another point is that the younger woman is Miss Ellen Ford of New York, sister of the editor and publisher of The Irish World. The article also states, to the casual observer, these two ladies possess nothing in common but their interest and their labor. Obviously, that's because one has a dark complexion and the other one has a fair or light complexion. Okay, so I know you caught the fact that Miss Ford, with the brunette complexion, born in Ireland, was the sister of the editor and publisher of the Irish World newspaper. As I mentioned in some of my previous videos, many of the Irish were brown or dark skinned. All right, so this is my seventh article, and this one is from the Burlington Hawkeye newspaper dated September 11th, 1887, page five. All right, so this one's located in the sixth column under the heading Notes for Women. Halfway down the page, it reads, Nellie Grant's daughter, little Vivian Satoris, is a beautiful child, playing on the beach at Long Beach with her maid the other day. She was a picture of attractive childhood, delicate, quick, and intelligently American rather than robustly English. She is not in the least like her father, but inherits her mother's eyes, brunette complexion, and shapely hands with a hint of General Grant about the forehead and rather prominent ears. Mrs. Sartoris dresses her with great taste, and the child is an unaffected, happy-looking creature. I saw a pretty incident, by the way, before I took my eyes off her. A lady with two children a little younger than Vivian, chubby creatures both, passed near the child and said something to her, little people which evidently interested them very much. The tots looked at each other a minute, then ran up to General Grant's granddaughter and emptied the treasure stones and shells they had picked up in their walk into a dainty straw basket that she carried. They trotted away without saying a word. Okay, so several things stand out in this article. 
Just for your information, Ulysses Grant was a Union Army General and the 18th President of the United States. And Nellie Grant is General Ulysses S. Grant's daughter. And then little Vivian, who is Nellie's daughter, is not like her father, but inherits her mother's eyes, brunette complexion, and shapely hands. Vivian also has a hint of General Grant about the forehead and ears. Also, both General Grant's daughter and granddaughter are women of color. So, if Nellie had a brunette complexion, it stands to reason that General Grant or his wife also was a person of color. Well, hey, let's find out which parent it was. If you guessed First Lady Mrs. Julia Dent Grant, you are correct. All right, so let's quickly look at an article that reveals the First Lady's complexion. And this article is from the Janesville Gazette, dated January 7th, 1876, page 2. And this article starts off on the first page where it's describing a White House reception. And then it goes on to the second page, of course, down to the third paragraph, first column. And it reads, Mrs. Grant wore black velvet over a canary-colored silk underskirt made and train the velvet reached to the bottom of the skirt front and back and cut up almost to the waist on the sides leaving the silk like side gores in the velvet the latter trimmed with heavy black lace the corsage was high a velvet with elaborate trimmings of silk the effect of these colors was very beautiful and becoming to her brunette complexion she wore diamond ornaments and her hair quite plain in puffs you must know that the president's wife is subject to much criticism on such occasions but on this day, the comments were universally favorable, and it was conceded by all that Mrs. Grant had never been more tastefully and becomingly attired. All right, as you heard and saw, the writer states, and I quote, the effect of these colors was very beautiful and becoming to her brunette complexion. All right, the other thing that stood out to me is when the writer mentioned that Mrs. Grant wore her hair plain in puffs. So I went ahead and I googled hair puffs, and clicked on images, and this is what I got. Hmm, interesting, wouldn't you say? All right, so let's take a look at this next article, and this one is from the Rock Island Argus newspaper, dated December 6, 1882, page 2. All right, so this one is located in the third column under the heading Our Girls, and it looks like it was from the New York Tribune. It basically looks like a reprint from the Tribune, and it goes on to read, did you ever see such pretty things as the boarding school girls of New York? They sally out to walk every afternoon, rosy with the strong airs of this low, nice island, demure as nuns and representatives of all places. But the native New York types prevails with this brunette skin, gray eyes, height of figure, almost manly countenance and carriage, and well-turned feet. The Philadelphia girls have gentler, more submissive faces, the Boston girls have more beans in their skin and culture in their scrawn. The Baltimore girls have lost their old reputation and prettier faces are now seen in Washington. Beauty in the West is very poorly organized and too corn fed, but there is a thing called style about these Manhattan bells which makes every one of them the model for a goddess of liberty. All right, so looking at this article, I can glean several important things. First of all, it's 1882, and they're speaking about a major metropolitan area of our country. And the author obviously feels strong ties to his city. He refers to these girls as the native New York type, like they are the standard of beauty. He describes these prototype girls as having brunette skin and gray eyes. At the end, he says, but there is a thing called style that these Manhattan bells, which makes every one of them the model for a goddess of liberty. And just for clarification, the word bells, uh, I looked it up according to Google Dictionary, it means a beautiful girl or woman, especially the most beautiful at a particular event or in a particular group. All right, so I'm just trying to show you here that women with uh, brunette complexions, aka brown complexions, were highly sought after. All right, we're getting down to the end here, and this uh, article here is from the Chicago Daily Tribune, dated April 12, 1874, page 6. All right, and it goes on to read, The New York Sun says the first Universalist Church of Jersey City have called the Reverend Phoebe A. Hannaford to preach for them for three years. She began her labor yesterday. She has taken a house in Summit Avenue and on the 1st of May will fit up and throw open the hospitable doors of her personage. The Reverend Phoebe A. Hannaford has a son in college 
a daughter of 11 years who lives with her, and a husband who is a physician in Boston. She has a clear voice and a distinct articulation, is thoroughly feminine, yet preponderantly intellectual. She is of medium size, has rich brown hair and eyes, broad forehead, and a brunette complexion. In the pulpit, she has the firm attitude, free gesture, and fluent delivery of a practice speaker. Okay, so what can we learn from this article? First of all, this is a woman that was an established reverend. Second, she had a son in college and a husband that was a physician in Boston. She was of medium size, rich brown hair and eyes, broad forehead, and a brunette complexion. I like to hammer home the point that brunette is a skin color, not generally used to describe hair and eyes. The writer mentioned that she had rich brown hair and eyes and added complexion as a separate category. Well, this is the last article I'm going to share on this video. Not that I don't have many more, however, I believe this one makes an interesting point regarding how people of color were perceived and valued at this time in history. All right, so this article comes from the Richmond Daily Dispatch, dated December 27th, 1865. All right, so it goes on to read, A popular societal fad in New York is to have books bound in colors to harmonize with the complexion or dress of the reader. One wealthy belle has had Shakespeare bound in brilliant red because it adds to the riches of her brunette complexion, while a blue-eyed damsel reads Tennyson from a becoming cover of Blue and Gold, Atlanta Constitution. All right, so it looks like this one is a reprint from the Atlanta Constitution newspaper. All right, so what really sticks out to me in this article is that it's 1865. The South has just lost the Civil War. And according to present historians, Southerners were not too happy with brown-skinned people at that time. Again, I mentioned current, present historians say this. Yet, this article speaks about a wealthy belle who coordinates her book covers to complement the richness of her brunette complexion, a.k.a. brown complexion. Remember, I find this intriguing because this newspaper article was printed in the South and two Southern newspapers. If we were going to believe current historians, what would Southerners, right after the Civil War in 1865, care about brown women of wealth matching their complexions to coordinate with their book covers? Hmm, something just isn't right if you believe the history that we've been given. So I want to reiterate what I've been preaching in my other videos. People with brown skin prior to the early 1900s were not ostracized. They were the norm, and they were considered beautiful. And also, something else that I've said previously is that many brown-skinned people were considered white because they had European lineage. What's funny, but not funny, is that now while researching for the last few years, there are articles that explain and theorize that maybe early Europeans had dark skin, like the Cheddar Man articles and a few similar articles. Now I'm seeing websites regarding Caucasians and how Caucasians generally have pale skin, but... They can also have yellow or brown or dark brown skin. What I believe is happening is that white historians and non-melanated researchers are realizing that people are finding the real historical information in books, journals, newspapers, and other sources and broadcasting the information for all to see. They have to now come up with a new spin on the white race to include people of color. Otherwise, the fake misleading historical lies will be exposed. What a pathetic and cowardly excuse to keep the racist, revisionist history going. If there were these brown-skinned Caucasians that some are claiming now, where are they depicted in paintings, photos, engravings, etc.? The brown-skinned people in history I'm telling you about and showing you evidence of were the first ladies of presidents and the wives of important men. These women were not second best. They did not play second fiddle. They were not only chosen by their husbands, but in the case of these first ladies, they were also chosen by the American people. These women, like the brown-skinned women you and I know today, are now called people of color, blacks, or African Americans. Maybe that's why white supremacy took hold in the late 19th century, because people of color were generally the chosen ones, and the non-melanated people, aka white people, were the exception. Also remember, skin color was the variable used since the late 19th century to discriminate. Now, all of a sudden, white supremacists and their enablers are being inclusive? Give me a freaking break. So, anyway, I really hope you are genuinely surprised with some of the revelations that I shared in part one of this video. 
Part two of this video will be coming soon and it will cover beautiful brunette women of Europe. There will be some definite shockers in that video as well, so stay tuned. Hey, if you haven't subscribed, please click the subscribe button and the notification bell so you don't miss any upcoming videos.